Hello and good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for today's presentation in our 2022 uh, Covey Lecture Series. Uh, my name is Doug Hunt, and I will be your moderator today. Our lecture will run about 45 minutes, and then we'll have a question and answer period following that. Uh, please feel free to type your questions into the chat feature at any time, and they will be shared at the end. I'm very pleased to welcome Belinda Kemp, Covey's senior enologist, as our speaker today. Uh, Belinda completed her PhD at Lincoln University in New Zealand in 2010 and is the senior scientist in enology at the Cool Climate Enology and Viticulture Institute here at Brock University, where her main research areas are wine, flavor, and aroma. She currently organizes Fizz Club for Canadian sparkling winemakers and serves on the VQA Ontario Standards Development Committee and the VQA Ontario Sparkling Wine Rules Committee. Today, Linda is going, is going to share a lecture titled, Magic of Mushrooms, the Potential Use of Mushroom-Derived Materials in the Winery. So with that, I'll, I'll ask uh, Belinda to begin. Hello, thank you for that introduction. Okay, first of all, just to explain what I'm going to cover today. Um, I'm going to just reiterate um, throughout this presentation that these are um, both parts of this study I'm presenting today are preliminary studies, um, really testing the ground and having a look to see where we go next with this. So the first part is actually about the filtration of winery waste water um, using oyster mushrooms in the picture below. Oh, sorry using material that have come from oyster mushrooms. I'm going to go over the uh, methodology and results for both parts of this. And then the second part, I'm just going to briefly touch upon the removal and um, the ability of mushroom-derived chitosan uh, to treat Pinot Noir sparkling juice or juice destined for sparkling wine. Um, and then talk a little bit more about the further research that uh, is going to be happening um, hopefully in the near future. So let us start. Winery waste water. Okay, so obviously we use a lot of water um, during wine production in dis uh, as well as distilleries, breweries and cideries. Everything from grape picking, processing, fermentation, wine styles and, wine pro and, and throughout wine production. There's many sorts of and types of wastewater treatments from activated sludge processes to all types of reactors like sequencing batch reactors, jet loop reactors, membrane and biofilms. But, but there's a big interest in more sustainable systems, systems that are more eco-friendly, shall we say. Um, so let's have a look a bit more. So wastewater actually contains phenolic compounds, alcohol, sugar, organic acids, yeast, um, uh, suspended solids and, and metals and many, all sorts of things like that, that we don't want going into um, any water system. Now, the thing with the winery um, as well is the quantity of water, that wastewater that we produce throughout the year depends very much on the technologies and the winemaking methods, but also it's going to differ depending on timing. So for instance, during harvest, we're obviously going to produce much more wastewater than we would necessarily at other times of the year. So we've got to have a system in place that can deal with that flux of, of huge amounts of water and then um, dribbles of it where we're not using so much. All regional wine um, uh, bodies, or, or I should say regional wine um, areas, have their own wastewater regulations and limits and disposal and treatment um, systems. Now, for in the Niagara regional wineries, we have quite a variety of on-site wastewater handling systems, um, as well as the aerated lagoons and activated sludge systems that, that are available. Um, and simple holding tanks. 
The most popular here in Niagara are constructed wetlands. Um, and this is coming from some work done by Melanie Johnson in her PhD at the University of Toronto, who studied uh, the wastewater systems and wastewater in the Niagara wine region. Our focus was uh, very much on, uh, on BOD, the biochemical oxygen demand, and the total suspended solids in the water and metals. We tested over 20 metals. So just a reminder that BOD is actually the measure of the amount of oxygen required to remove waste organic matter from water. Um, the other particular metal that, that we focused on, well, we did many metals, but that is of particular interest here uh, in Niagara and anywhere really is phosphorus and controlling the phosphorus discharge from municipal and industrial um, sites like wineries um, is of particular interest and that's because of the effect it can have on things like oxygen depletion in water or um, algae blooming as well so a lot of emphasis put on phosphorus too. Um, one of the things that has garnered a lot of interest in recent years is mycelium, particularly mushroom mycelium, both live and dead. One of the main reasons for that is that it can purify water and that's one part that's got a lot of attention. So mycelium is the vegetative underground part of, of a uh, fungus. In this case, in our case, it's, it's mushrooms. Um, and it's a, it's a biomaterial, it's sustainable, it's natural, it has a symbiotic relationship with nature, it's capable of some amazing things, it, it grows in salt water, it helps break down oil and toxins in water, breaks bio, even biodegradable plastic down, as well as um, things like soil remediation on, on toxic sites, and as I mentioned, purifies water. Now, the mushroom that has the, or the mycelium um, from the oyster mushroom is the one that has the most attention because its ability has so many different types of abilities and is really one of the strongest and can produce some of the strongest mycelium as well. I'd also just like to point out at this stage that I'm not a mycologist, um, so you might not want to ask me too many questions about mushrooms and mycelium. Um, I'm using this as a product to treat uh, to treat water. So just put my hand up and make that clear there. So fungal based biocomposite materials have really exploded uh, in the last decade, probably even less than that, actually. Um, and one of the reasons is it's an eco friendly material with a huge wide range of options. So you can, you, you can, as I mentioned, the remediation of soil and water, it's even used in packaging materials. You can see there, uh, it, there's a bottle of wine in there, but I know the computer system, Dell computers and also Ikea computers are very proud of their mushroom, um, uh, mushroom derived packaging as well for, for their um, products. So soil, water, uh, but then we've even um, seeing it being used now in the production of handbags, vegan leather clothes um, uh, and many other things. And I'm sure that we'll see a lot more of it and, and different uses for it as we get to understand how the materials work in the future and develop methods and um, production and processes to produce these sort of material, the, these different types of materials. So we're particularly interested though in the biosorption properties and biodegradation um, of mushroom mycelium. And it has been said that fungal biotechnology is actually going to play an important role or can play an important role in the transition from a fossil based economy to a resource efficient circular economy. There's a quote there from uh, Maya et al. Um, and what we're seeing is we're seeing from industry, the production of metals, and it's not just from industry. It could be, if we put it in the context of vineyards, it could be vineyard sprays, for instance, where we're adding things and spraying things. It could be uh, all, all number of reasons, but 
the thing about the mushroom is that it's the mycelium underground that can absorb those metals or take those metals in. I shouldn't say absorb, I'll explain that in a moment. And then it goes up to the fruiting body. There is one, which is the actual mushroom. There is one thing to remember about this though, is um, those metals that it takes up still have to go somewhere and they're going into the mushroom. So if you're using mushrooms for soil remediation or water remediation, you might not want to pick them and eat them and have them with your um, fried eggs and bacon in the morning for breakfast. Um, so just to be aware of that, just to warn people. Um, but the other thing about the mycelium underground is it does consume metals. Um, and this ability differs between mushrooms and one of the the most successful that has this ability uh, is are the oyster mushrooms. So just just to reiterate and explain, there's our mushroom growing uh, in figure two above ground and you can see underground the the um, dense mass of fine mycelium and it extends right through the sub substrate, which is in this case the soil or even you see mushrooms growing on wood um, and it can transport water and nutrients. Um, and how that works is the mycelium excretes enzymes which break down the substrate a bit and the and so can be absorbed through the mice these nutrients and metals and things can be absorbed through the mycelium cell wall this is of course in live mushrooms and that's an important point i want to make in a moment because both live and dead mycelium um, have have important roles and work slightly differently one thing i wanted to point out though um, which leads nicely into part one and part two actually of this study is that we have in the cell wall chitin and we can treat gut chitin and chitin can then be turned into uh, chitosan which is what is in part two uh, of this presentation. So one of the ways that live and dead mycelium um, can break down metals and, and work on soil and water is through what we, what's called biosorption. So for live biomass, so in this case it's live uh, mushrooms or live fungi, um, it's basically an, it's an active process that happens, so both internally and externally at the cellular level, so through detoxification, chelation um, and that aspect. And, and so it, the, the material, the plant or the mycelium accumulates the metals. When we have dead mycelium or what's referred to as inactive biomass, then that's a slightly, that's a different process. It's passive adsorption. And that means it's basically where it's cell surface binding. So, so the metals bind with the cell walls, uh, the dead cell walls, if you like, of, of the mycelium, of the material. So one definition of biosorption is the passive uptake of metal ions by dead or inactive biomass from an aqueous solution, which is probably the best and easiest way to think of it when we think about um, how, much, how mycelium works in this instance. What has been studied over the last, oh gosh, I, I've, the first I've got here about 20 years altogether, so quite some time, is that dead biomass, uh, in the, the type of stuff that we're using, is much is more superior, much better um, than live biomass to remove metals from contaminated soils. Um, not so clear about that in water, so we'll see what happens. So the aim of our study, um, this part one, which again, you know, just want to reiterate, was a preliminary study to see its, its ability, was to determine whether mushroom derived dead mycelium could remove metals from wastewater using filtration. This is winery wastewater. It's at this point, I just want to bring into the picture and thank colleagues at the University of Brighton who I'm sorry, the University of British Columbia in Vancouver, um, the team at the Pulp and Paper Centre. And that's Michael Reza and Professor James Olson, who's the director of the centre, and for funding from Ontario Grape and Wine Research, both of whom uh, put some faith in me doing something a bit different than what I would normally get involved with. 
So this is um, a ch the chain of events that um, the University of British Columbia, who are the people who made these pads in the first place. And this is, this is the process by which they produced them. So they used, um, they put together all the ingredients that were needed for what, for what is the structure or the scaffold as it's referred to. Um, and, they, and for that, they used foam paper um, put those ingredients together and they put in some nutrition for the mycelium because it still needs a bit of nutrition um, and then introduced air in it to foam it up and make it more of a foam. They grew mushrooms, oyster mushrooms, from uh, fed with sawdust. Sawdust strengthens the mycelium and the mushrooms so they become more rigid. Um, and then removed that and broke that down. And the sawdust mycelium mix was then incorporated into what's referred to as the foam paper. These are then stacked airtight in, and stored in a dark and humid climate controlled storage area. And they grow in the darkness for several weeks. Uh, that can also be one of the things about live and dead mycelium um, is that it, the, this is the preparation time, but the live mycelium can take even longer to work. So just throw that in there when we talk later on about this too. The samples then have to be dried and the final product comes out as a sort of slightly off square and uh, we wet them, compress them and cut them into discs to fit the filter. These are the discs. One of the things you'll see is the white on the on the pad on the left is actually the dead mycelium and the other stuff is its structure that it's that they're bound to. It's really quite rigid and strong and can crack easily when we get there. So which is one of the reasons why we immersed it in distilled water to cut it into discs. Um, pressed it in a flour press to flatten it and, and even out the surfaces and remove that excess water. So the final diameter was just 8.6 centimetres and the thickness, which you'll sort of see in the bottom picture there, uh, was 0.5 centimetres. So we weighed it before and after pressing and then weighed it after use as well. Um, and after filtration, there was an 8 um, eight percent increase uh, in the weight of it due to the absorption of the water. So how I did this was I visited three drains in three wineries during in the Niagara region during the harvest. Um, so one winery was on the 17th of September, one was the 6th of October and one was the 14th and you'll see that was 17th was around sparkling wine time. Uh, winery two was around white wine time and winery three around the red started coming in um, and were there too. So we took, I took 1,100 uh, milliliters of water, duplicate samples from each drain. 500 of wastewater was sent off um, before and after filtration for analysis of boards, uh, TSS, so total suspended solids phosphorus analysis that's because one's particular analytical laboratory um, does those analyses for the Niagara region and 50 mils were taken before and after treatment um, and they were sent uh, for metal analysis so everything was done in duplicate. All health and safety was adhered to including all the PPE as you can see safety tucked in there um, uh, including a mask to help with the smell. If anybody's been down drains, you'll understand the reason for that. So <laughs> we look, so the analysis um, for that was done at Niagara Analytical Laboratories in Niagara Falls, and they're an accredited water and wastewater lab that um, some of the wineries use here in Niagara. 20 metal ions were analysed according to the method um, uh, by Sharnak. Sharnock et al, et al sorry, um, in the American Journal of Enology and Viticulture, so just a little plug there for Hannah's latest work, um, using ICPMS, and this work was done by colleagues at the at Queen's University in Kingston, and there we are, thank you for Amelie for uh, fun in wine science um, picture just there going down the drain. Okay, winery three, the first set of results we got, well, wasn't as hopeful as it, and exciting as I was hoping. Uh, we, I, 
uh, did use what's called uh, palcentino filter, so a very small filter that allows for that pad. But and the time, the contact time, or the time it took to filter was six minutes, and that becomes important in a couple of slides later on. So just wants to bring that to your attention. But you can see from table one. When it comes to the suspended solids, we did decrease a little bit of that, but not by much. There was a, a st statistically, there was a bit of a significance, but not as much uh, with regards to the volume that we really wanted to see. It's a similar situation with the bod that was, um, that was uh, uh, decreased, but not by much either. And unfortunately, and I just don't know why at the moment, but the phosphorus increased, levels increased. Um, the only part of the, um, the only winery or the only drain that had any significant, statistically significant differences was this particular drain, winery three. And it could be um, because that was towards the end of harvest later in the harvest and maybe there was more material more more stuff in the water by that point i just don't know it could have been its location um so not as exciting and earth shattering as um as i had hoped at this stage but there's more so because we analyzed 20 metals and in three drains is too much data to show you. So I'm just giving you a small snapshot of, of one uh, winery drain. Let's have a look at calcium decrease slightly. And in the column on the end here, um, the final column, it's the percent increase or decrease. And again, you're, we're not seeing a huge difference in the concentration of these compounds. Um, chromium, uh, was cut uh, was also also decreased copper increased slightly unfortunately and um, the other two were not statistically significant now across all the wineries and for all the metals there was no one particular trend or pattern that was seen um, and there's several reasons for this although there were differences seen they weren't huge and that's because the factors that influence the removal of metals um, using dead mycelium. Let's just have a look. One is how much is in there of, of the metal is in there in the first place. The amount of contact time, remember I told you there was only six minutes for filtering just now in the slide earlier. That's why I mentioned it, because the amount of contact time that the mycelium or the dead mycelium is in contact with the water um, is important. The temperature of the solution, which unfortunately I didn't measure at the time, but that's also um, important. And the pH level, different metal ions are attracted uh, to the mycelium at different pH levels. Ideally, if we were around, um, or it depends which metal at the moment, so that's not so easy to explain, but um, you'll see that our winery wastewater differs. So we've got one winery was at a pH 4, 4.4. Uh, the water winery 2 was 6.2 and at winery 3 was 3.8. So chromium elutes at, uh, within one's, um, not elutes, sorry, um, binds to, to the dead mycelium at a particular um, pH compared to lead, for instance, or iron. So as I mentioned, no trends and there was minimal contact. It was a starting preliminary study. Um, and this is where the science, we then build on the science. So what we need to do is change the pH of the wastewater to target specific metals. Maybe there's a system to a flow system we can do that with. Remove, another one is to remove the inactive mycelium from the pads and clean that up, purify that and trial it in a granule form or, or grind it down into powder form so it's not attached to the structure and then add it um, and drop that into the wastewater for longer contact time. That's another possibility. So we could extend the contact time and, and um, without the filtration. Another one is to consider whether it could also remove other compounds like pesticides and temperature, monitor temperature and test as well a range of metal iron concentrations. So it might be that the higher it is, the more 
the easier it is. It will depend on, I, su I suspect, binding sites within the cells, within the dead mycelium as well. So a number of things to um, think about. And another one, of course, is embedding it onto a materials um, that's in constant contact as well. Some sort of material that could be submerged into the water. OK, so from the winery wastewater, let's move into the winery and have a look what um, we can do with the mushrooms in there or, or mushroom material, I should say, just to state that. And the first thing is chitosan, mushroom chitosan. And what chitosan is, it's already um, you know, being used in winemaking, but it's a natural linear polysaccharide. Um, and basically it's obtained from chitin. Remember the picture of the chitin of the cell in the cell wall of the mycelium. And that chitosan is produced under alkaline conditions. There's certain methods you can turn uh, chitin and, and techniques, uh, which I'm not covering today, but to turn chitin into chitosan. So it's the most abundant uh, polysaccharide in nature after cellulose. Main component of the cell walls, as we saw, not just a fungi, but also plants, insects, crustaceans, which is one of the reasons why these um, materials are used in, in the production of chitosan. Um, it's insoluble in, war, in wine. Chitosan, um, chitin not so much, which is why chitosan um, is insoluble in water, but also chitosan and the chitin blue can um, are both of our fungal origin, but both come from Aspergillus niger, and both are permitted in winemaking in some countries. And so we know that they're, they're approved as processing age in winemaking in the EU and uh, the USA as clarifying um, agents or, um, and, and settling agents. Um, there are some products available, for instance, that can remove brett um, from a wine as well. Now, Aspergillus niger is the one that's permitted in the winemaking in those countries, but there is chitosan also available that's being produced from crustaceans. Um, so things like prawns, shrimp, crabs. The problem with that is there is concern about its potential to cause allergic reactions, which is one of the reasons why it's not permitted in the Aspergillus niger um, form of chitosan is. But the interesting thing is that there are studies that have shown that the structure of the of the chitosan from the sea, from the crustaceans is exactly the same structure as that from Aspergillus niger but we don't know what else is in there whether it's totally purified with hence the use of Aspergillus niger a study's just come out as well that um, has shown that mushroom chitosan produced from mushrooms also has exactly the same structure as Aspergillus niger. So it suggests that it's all the same, all the same sort of thing. Okay, so it's used in winemaking. Well, as I mentioned, it can remove um, Botanomyces, it can remove lactic acid bacteria. It can also remove, it's been found in a study quite some time ago um, to reduce Acetobacter quite considerably. Protein removal is another one. Um, it can clarify um, and it's been used in flotation. And the one we're particularly interested in is the reduction in browning um, as an, as an anti, its ability as an antioxidant. And it, it can also reduce metal content uh, in, in wine as well and ochratoxin, which we know we don't want, and um, also been found to remove of, um, volatile phenols, but we're using it specifically mainly for browning and hydroxycinamic acids in our study. So hydroxycinamic acids are the main phenolic compounds found in sparkling wines, um, hence are in my, my interest or our interest in this. Um, it's also, apart from their positive and negative attributes to wine, um, is also a major cause of browning in grape juice and wine, um, whether that be in whites uh, or in, in sparkling juice um, and base wine. So that's, so we, I really wanted, we, so we wanted to have a look and see if chitosan could reduce or remove these compounds. Um, another 
part that it fits into within the studies in in my lab is that it negatively these compounds negatively have been found to impact the Maillard reaction um, which is another area of research that um, some of the students are working on um, so let's have a look well the, uh, the aims of the project well first of all just to mention that it's the first time that mushroom de derived chitosan has been used in any form of wine making um, particularly in juice uh, well actually it's just in anything to do with wine making um, it was added in our study to juice um, after whole bunch pressing there was no SO2 added so as to not to interfere with any of the results or any of the browning which was quite scary I have to say um, and one of the reasons why we, we um, stored the juice um, for 18 hours I'm getting a bit nervous uh, on that aspect so we still wanted to produce um, a base wine that could go on to be made into sparkling wines and the other thing that turned out uh, we, we, we were looking at pesticide removal and a spray for Botrytis luna was sprayed and we went in uh, once the safe period uh, came around but unfortunately between the spray and us going in to pick the grapes there was a downfall of rain for two days so we did send off samples of the juice um, before and after treatment for pesticide analysis but because of the rain um, the limits the, the amount of pesticide well, I think is mainly the rain the amount of pesticide was so low it was below detectable le levels of the method so we had included that originally but unfortunately the weather was against us on that one so the aims of the study or the parts that I'm showing you um, briefly today was to establish whether mushroom derived chitosan could actually reduce um, browning in juice and wine um, and also to determine the impact that mushroom derived chitosan could have on hydroxycinamic acids in juice and sparkling wine so here are products um, it's important to note at this stage that none of these products were made specifically for winemaking. Um, so the one on the end, the, the low, which is a low weight, uh, low molecular weight my, mushroom chitosan, um, which is which are, uh, comprises of oligosaccharides, um, would not be thought of as wine, and that it's got that orangey brown colour. Um, which we but we did include it because there wasn't any at the time any other low molecular weight uh, chitas at mushroom chitosan available medium molecular weight and what's referred to as high molecular weight and you can see that the high molecular weight is 600 um, the the medium one 250 to 300 and the low molecular weight is less than three it's quite low we also included in the trial some bentonite activated charcoal because that's used in the industry one to remove pesticides and and the other to remove phenolics so that's why this particular product was chosen um, this is also important to state here that this is the work this part is part of the master's degree that um, uh, Jacob is working on within my lab as well so I'd like to just acknowledge him and acknowledge all his work that he's doing so we handpicked the Pinot Noir from a vineyard in Niagara on the lake we whole bunch pressed it uh, into one tank and then divided that into 15 glass carboys each individual carboy was then analyzed the juice was analyzed pre-treatment for Briggs TA pH, malic, acetic, and yan, and again, no SO2 added. And again, it was uh, analyzed after the treatment so that uh, we had the data before and after. So we had the control, we had the bentonite activated charcoal, as I mentioned, and then the low, medium, and high molecular weight. Jacob did some bench trials to see whether it need, these products needed to be activated with, in, within water or could be added directly and the result his his um, test showed that they could be added direct to juice um, and which he did and cold settled the juice for 18 hours of four degrees we racked off the solids and um and then the juice was inoculated after an hour took samples for analysis but then inoculated at I, with ioc 2007 yeast fermentation was um, monitored at 18 degrees and then after fermentation and, and fermenta uh, when it fermented to dryness 
Lapidoff Lees for wine analysis. So there we go. The first set of analyses I want to show you, which we found we're finding the most interesting at the moment, because he's done a lot of work, so I can't include everything in it. Um, but the pH range, uh, just to let you know before I go into that bit, the pH range from um, 3 to 3.1, the TA 8.5 to 9.7. So we did see a bit of a change in the in the TA. I'm not sure if that's down to the set cold settling or the treatment though at the moment. The BRICS was 15.1 to 15.2. Malik 4.5 to 4.7. And acetic, um, there were differences in acetic acid from 0.02 to 0.05. Now, the yarn at the beginning, the total yarn, was, uh, tended to be predominantly amino acids. And we can see that there was no difference um, uh, between those yarn levels, between the juices before we started. And this was all done in triplicate, remember. Um, but what we see after, in the juice after treatment, is the low molecular weight um, chitosan, the, the, the juice that had been treated with the low molecular weight chitosan, had increased, statistically in, increased, in, uh, in yarn levels. And this is due to the amino acids. So either the chitosan activated something or acted on the solids and released more amino acids or put amino acids into it. Or maybe there were some chitinases that started working as well that came in with the product. I don't know. Of course, now then you've got the other thing is that chitinases, the family of chitinases are within the group of compounds that can affect hazing uh, and cause haze in white wine. Um, but that's not wasn't part of this particular study. OK. The other thing was you can see the pictures along the top here and you see the one in the middle, the very dark one, um, which is that orangey sort of dark brown orangey color. And it's important to say that these are the base wines before cold settling and racking. We didn't. That wasn't it. They all look slightly odd colors of lemonade. But this one in the middle is the low molecular weight one. Um, and the thing about that is the brown, the orangey brown color of the chitosan appears to have stayed in the, in the wine, uh, in, in the juice and the wine. Um, and that product can be made to be white. Uh, and had we said that at the beginning, um, then we could put, I could possibly have got that done, but unfortunately that. Um, but if that this was something that was to be used in the future in winemaking, it can be turned white and this wouldn't um, then be avoided. So what we see here is a slight, really small difference in pH and TA. Um, the high molecular weight was a little bit higher. The residual sugar as a result of fermentation was highest in the control. No difference in malic, a little tiny bit of difference there in acetic acid. This is now the wine, um, just to remind, this is the wine chemical analysis, not the juice. What I'm getting more interested in here is the dissolved oxygen in the control was higher, um, albeit um, not a huge difference. It was still significant between treatments, particularly the chitosan, and that's another area that's worth pursuing um, in the future. And turbidity differences as well with the low molecular weight. Um, so we'll, but which will, of course will have uh, implications for making, um, producing the base wine and, and will need settling and sorting out before this was after it uh, had been settled, this data, by the way, but before it gets made into, um, inoculated and made into uh, sparkling wine. Browning was another area we were um, particularly interested in and continue to be interested in. And the low molecular weight um, chitosan, uh, just in the middle there, um, had much higher absorbance, so a higher browning. Uh, but you saw that in the pictures, and, I, and we suspect that that comes more from the product. And chi that chitosan is actually absorbed at that wavelength um, at, at for 20 nanometers, which is probably the reason for that. So probably need needed more in-depth studies with regards to um, 
to browning. But when we come to caffeic and caftoric acid, the two main hydroxycinamic acids that Jacob worked on, um, he did this analysis on the uh, uh, LCMS. Um, what we do see here is the low molecular weight, uh, which is referred to here on this graph in the middle as T1, actually ended up uh, reducing the cuftauric acid quite dramatically. Um, and you can see the difference there is pretty big, well, reasonably big, or say that it's uh, 2.2 or something compared to um, the bentonite, activated bentonite charcoal and the high molecular weight, there's still a bit of a difference. And I'm sure, remember this is Pinot Noir juice and wine, which has lower cafe and cafetaric acid than a Chardonnay, for instance, uh, which has much more. So around five uh, milligrams per litre of cafetaric or cafeic acid is not unusual. Um, so this is a bit lower in there, in the lower molecular weight one. So a couple of other points to think about um, with mushroom chitosan is um, we mentioned the risk, uh, the potential concern, I should say, uh, with regards to crustacean chitosan for its, for, and that's why it's not being used in winemaking. But is there a risk to allergy sufferers, those who suffer from mushroom allergies, if it's used as a wine, um, a fining agent or processing aid in juice and wine? Well, it has the same structure as Aspergillus niger, and it's used as a dietary, it's available as a dietary supplement. But again, with the dietary supplement, it's one of those things is you can choose to take it or not. So if you have a mushroom allergy, you're obviously not going to take a, a, a mushroom derived product necessarily. I'm not quite sure why you would want to do that anyway. You don't just eat a mushroom, but that's another, another project for another day. Um, but but the other thing, but when it comes to wine and it's not on the label, then we don't have so much have a choice of it. Is it, would chitosan, mushroom chitosan, be a problem with it for allergy sufferers? I don't know. the The cause of allergy sufferer so mushroom allergies is a protein which in, within the mushroom, and I can't imagine that that remains in dead um, mycelium that's been turned into chitosan. However, I'm, as I said, I'm not a mycologist, um, so I'm not entirely sure about that, but it is something to keep in mind. And there is a lot more work to do on mushroom chitosan um, before we get to the level that could be considered being produced or made into a product that's suitable for winemaking. And anybody who does do that would need to um, possibly include that aspect of it in the studies. It is, however, um, produced and, and used currently in things like biomedical devices, wound healing, uh, scaffolding tissue for engineering, pharmaceutical and cosmetics industry use it. It's antimicrobial. It's also used in fertilizers and also as a growth elicitor for plants and is incorporated into some sprays and food um, preservation as well. So it's abilities um, to be used in many different, uh, in a variety of applications is, is huge. So why not test it a little bit more further in juice and then wine? So some further re research questions that we need to answer about mushroom chitosan is, does it in any way affect the sensory characteristics of wine? Now, the first thing is we saw the color of the orange one, but again, Think of that being um, being turned into white um, powder, uh, and then that we wouldn't have that sort of issue. Can mushroom chitosan be used for targeted wine fining for a specific compound in the same way that the chitosan is being used? Chitosan products are being developed for specific items. Could mushroom derived chitosan um, be used to remove smoke taint? from juice or wine, that's another one. Um, again, we have to remember though that, that it would need to be compared to other chitosan products, Aspergillus niger products. Um, even though the structure is the same, we still need to find out, make sure it's pure, um, it's pure chitosan. And it really needs testing in wine and not just in juice. Uh, that's something that Jacob's going to uh, be working on a little bit in the future. 
with regards to the winery waste water um, study that you saw in part one, that really needs collaboration with chemical engineers and winery wastewater experts, neither of which I am. Um, I was interested in whether we could use this, the, this biodegradable, this eco-friendly product in uh, wastewater processing systems. Um, I am meeting with somebody next month who is able to uh, remove the dead mycelium from these pads who can process it, purify it, and then we could put it into wastewater. And then he's also um, particularly interested in then removing the metals that, that it absorbs, which then can go on to be used in other, other things and other items and products. So a full circular um, sustainable system, if you like, is something that we're looking into. So hopefully, fingers crossed, we can take that to the next level as well. At this point, I'd like to thank colleagues and everybody involved. So our friends over, our new friends over at the University of British Columbia, Michael Reza and Professor James Olson uh, at the Paper and Pulp Centre there. Jacob, the uh, MSc student who's been particularly busy and has done all this work on the kite design and continues to, to do it um, quite successfully. My co-PI, um, Gary Pickering, uh, who, uh, who's the co-PI on the OGRI funding for this. And it's them I'd like to thank again, um, who, who, <laughs> who thought it was worthy to go down the mushroom uh, product funding route and Andrew Peller Limited as well, who also co-funded some of this research. Sarah, who did some of the, the, the beautiful mycelium infographic you saw, and the three wineries who let me go down their drains, which was really important in the middle of harvest, me turning up in a white suit and being quite annoying to get in and get down the drains at the busiest time of year. So thank you to the wineries, Chateau de Charme, Malavoie and Trias. Some references there for you, and I can send anybody any details um, as we progress and carry on with this sort of work. And any questions? Um, I would just like to remind people before you put up your digital hand um, that I'm not a mycologist, so uh, maybe not ask me questions <laughs> about about mycology. Um, and I can refer them to a friend of mine who is though. Um, and get back to you if you did want to ask me any mushroom questions. So thank you. I'd just like to hand back there, Doug. Perfect. Thank you, Belinda. Um, I think if you just, yeah, perfect. You stopped sharing your screen. Excellent. So now we can enter the question portion. Um, thank you so much for that, that fantastic lecture. Uh, our, our first question was just, um, What's been the reception from the three partner wineries to this research while while you've been doing it? They they um actually super enthusiastic. Everybody in the Niagara wine region, in the wineries and the winemakers, are always looking at sustainable new materials, um, things that are eco friendly, that are environmentally friendly. So it had a lot of support when I started and I was doing it with the initial preliminary stuff, um, I got a, help, a lot of help and, I, and, and wineries offered to let me go into their drains. Um, there's only so many drains any one person can, <laughs> can manage. So um, there was only three at this stage and it was to be able to see what the, um, the its ability, it was just a, what's called seed funding to investigate preliminary investigation as to where we take this this sort of stuff next, um, but there's so many ways we can do this in the future. So I'm really looking forward to it. But in answer to your initial question, before I start sort of going off on a tangent, um, really receptive, really like doing something like this, which is a bit off the beaten track and certainly a bit different from things that I've done before at Coven. That actually really segues well into our, our second question, which is just, um, you mentioned sort of potential for further research, but I, I think our, our viewers would like to know what next, Have where where are you headed next as far as have you got plans for further research in this area? Like where, what's the next step? 
Yeah, um, there's a master student, Jacob, who I mentioned um, in part two of that, and he's going to be doing a little bit of work on the um, uh, on on using mushroom chitosan products in wine. Um, so, and that's certainly an area. But I'd I'd really like to have a look at being able to compare that to um, Aspergillus niger chitosan in winemaking and also its ability to do things like uh, reduce acetic acid levels in wine, um, which can happen with uh, and other products associated with things like botrytis or sour rot. Uh, we don't know um, enough about its ability to do things like that within, with both of which, are, which can be issues in, for grape growers as, as well um, and in the winery. So, that would be an area I'm looking at further down the line. And of course, I've got this meeting next month uh, with regards to how we can utilize the dead mycelium in a wastewater system that could become a sort of a, the idea in the future being a sustainable circular system. Um, so those two things at the moment. Well, that meeting sounds exciting. Hopefully, hopefully the next time you're speaking to us, we'll be hearing about the results of that meeting. <laughs> Thanks very much. No problem. So that looks to be uh, all the questions we've received today. Once again, I'd like to, uh, to thank Belinda for joining us today and, and to everyone who joined us virtually. Uh, today's lecture uh, will be posted shortly to our website at brocku.ca slash covey. And you can also find more info about the lecture series as a whole on that website. Uh, coming up next in the 2022 Covey Lecture Series will be uh, Monday, April 4th. Uh, when wine writer, uh, wine writer slash author uh, Ronald Jackson uh, speaks about wine and food, perfect, perfect marriage or myth. And then on Monday, April 11th, when Covey director uh, researcher Debbie Inglis uh, speaks on enhancing the Sauvignon Blanc character in Vidal table wines. You can, we hope you can join us when we return next week. Uh, have a great day.